When you compile and run a simple Java program, you may only use built-in Java classes. So for example, in a Hello World program that uses system.out.println, you're using the system class from one of the core Java libraries. There's no need to tell the Java compiler and the Java virtual machine the location of that system class. That's because it's one of the so-called bootstrap classes loaded for you automatically by Java. As you can see, our simple Hello World program compiles and executes just fine. So, what happens if you want to use classes from a Java library that's not built in? For example, let's say we were interested in using the JSUP Java library that allows you to work in all kinds of fancy ways with HTML. JSOUP is described at the jsoup.org website, so let's go there in our browser. The home page of that website describes JSOUP and gives a two-line code snippet for retrieving and parsing a Wikipedia web page. If you look at that code snippet, you'll quickly suspect that the only way it can be so short is because it uses JSOUP classes that is, classes beyond those built into Java. The people at jsoup.org have written extensive Java code in their classes that make it easy to fetch the Wikipedia web page with just a single statement. A lot of Java programming that you'll see, especially as you advance, makes use of non-core libraries like jsoup. By using those libraries, programmers don't have to reinvent the wheel and can capitalize on high quality and free code that's been written and shared by others. So what do you need to do in order to use this Java library? First, you'll need to download the library. You'll notice that the jsoup.org website has a download link in the header, so click on that. On the download page, you'll see that the library is distributed as a jar file. A jar file is an archive, just like a Windows zip file, for example, that can contain multiple Java class files. It also contains a special file called the manifest. Two of the three jar files shown are for documentation and source code. We won't use those right now. The link and jar file we're interested in is jsoup dash 1.7.3.jar. Click on that link to download the jar file and store it on your computer. We'll store it in a new jsoup subdirectory of our software directory. We'll need the path of that directory later, so you may want to copy that to the clipboard or notepad or somewhere else. So now we have a jar file stored locally. We know that it contains JSOUP Java classes that we'll want to use in our program. Before we write that program, let's poke around in that jar file a bit just to see what's there. If you have a program like 7-zip for working with archives, you can examine the contents of the jar file. If you right click on it, you'll be able to open the archive. You'll see that there's an org folder and a jsoup folder under that. Within that jsoup folder are a number of Java class files. For example, there's a jsoup.class file. You may remember the code snippet from the jsoup.org page made use of the jsoup class which will be the bytecode in this file. You see that all of the JSOUP code that's been written has been encapsulated into the single package jar file. That's pretty handy. If there were just some way we could reference that single jar file when compiling or running a Java program, 
we'd be able to easily have all that power of JSOOP at our fingertips. Back to that in a bit. Now let's write a small JSOOP program to print out some of the Wikipedia headlines. We'll include the two-line snippet as a starting point. That code can't stand alone, though. To run it, we'll need to insert it into a main method. That main method will need to be within the class that we define for our Java program. Let's call our program class wikiheadlines.java. Let's change the URL that JSOUP will go to in order to retrieve the page's HTML. We'll do this because the published URL on jsoup.org redirects to a different address. And although JSOUP handles this correctly, we'll generally want to use the final destination in our programs. The JSOUP connect method returns a connection object and the JSOOP connection class has a static get method. This get method is what fetches the HTML and then it's stored in a JSOOP document object. That document object will contain many elements, but with its select method we can create a set of only the HTML elements we're interested in. The second line of the JSOOP code snippet isn't quite right. It might be that Wikipedia changed the HTML for that page after the snippet was written. To extract the headlines, we'll make a small change here to get the correct elements from the document. Don't worry too much about the string that goes in the select method at this point. You can always read up later on so-called selectors. Let's try running this short program and see what happens. When we run the Java C command to compile the program, we see several errors. These errors are occurring because the compiler sees certain types that it's not aware of. So the compiler sees the JSOUP class as well as the document and elements types. Because those aren't built-in Java types, the compiler reports an error and needs more information about the three. Consider what the compiler thinks, that is if a compiler could think, when it encounters document. There's no way at this point that it knows document is referring to a JSOOP document, or even some other document in a completely different Java library. Document would be a very common name for a Java type. One way that we can provide more information about JSOOP, document, and elements is to add import statements to the top of our program. How do we know which import statements we need to add? Let's refer back to the jsoup.org site. One of the header links was to the API reference. This reference gives us detailed information about the classes and other types in the JSOOP library. If we look on the left hand side of that reference page, we will find the document class is listed there. As it turns out, the class name isn't really document. It's the full name org.jsoup.nodes.document. Its name includes the package prefix, the org.jsoup.nodes. Likewise, you can look up JSOOP and Elements in the API reference 
and you'll find their complete names there. Those two full names are org.jsoup.jsoup and org.jsoup.select.elements. Once you've added the imports for those three types, you'll be able to reference them with their shorter names, JSOUP document elements, in your program. The Java compiler will know that you're after a specific type. A couple notes before we go on. The import statement is declaring what's called a namespace for the Java type. So when the abbreviated name is used in the program, the compiler will know which type is intended. Second, instead of adding the imports, that is the namespace, you could use the complete class name in your program. For example, you could replace document with org.jsoup.nodes.document. Most people use the import approach, though. Now that we've added the imports to our program, let's try compiling it again. So what in the world is happening here? We've added the import statements. Why is the compiler still having trouble with these types? Well, what you've done with the imports is to clarify which document class your program is using, but you haven't supplied that external code to the compiler yet. In other words, the compiler knows that you want to use the org.jsoup.nodes.document class but it doesn't know where that actual code resides and as a result can't load it. Since you've already downloaded the JSOUP jar to a directory on your computer, at this point you just need some way to tell the compiler where that jar file is located. That's done through the class path option on Java C. You'll need to specify the path where the jar file is located including the name of the jar file itself. We're using Windows, so if that path contains spaces, you'll need to enclose it in quotation marks. You'll also notice that a Windows-like path with backslashes works. When we recompile now, there are no longer errors associated with the types. The compiler knows where the JSOUP library is located. We are, however, receiving a different error now. This error takes a little bit of head scratching, but what's happening is that the get method can potentially have trouble when it retrieves the HTML from a web address. So the get method, as written, declares that it can throw an I.O. exception if that happens. We'll enclose our statements in a try-catch block to handle that. Recompiling again. Nice, no errors. Does this mean that our program will work correctly? Not necessarily, but it does at least compile. Let's try running the program now. Just as we specified class path on the Java C command, we'll now specify it on the Java command for the Java virtual machine. If you don't add the class path, the JVM won't know where that library is at runtime. When we try to run our program, it fails with an error that it cannot find or load the main class wiki headlines. 
What's happening here is that the Java Virtual Machine is finding the JSUP classes because of our class path, but it's not finding the Wiki Headlines class itself. Of course, after we'd successfully compiled Wiki Headlines.java, the Wiki Headlines.class file was stored in the current directory. We need to modify our class path and explicitly tell the JVM that the current directory is where it can find that file. A class path string can contain multiple paths. In our case on Windows, we'll separate each path from the next with a semicolon, and we represent the current directory with a dot. We can use Windows up arrow to modify a previous command. So we'll go ahead and modify the previous Java command, inserting the path for the current directory. Our program runs with no errors. So far, so good. The program, as is, just retrieves the HTML from the Wikipedia page and parses it. It doesn't print anything really to show us that this is working. Let's change our program to print any headlines it found to the console. We know that those headline elements will be stored in an elements instance. Going back to our jsoup.org API documentation page, we can look at the elements type. It has some useful methods such as size and get that we'll use to print individual elements. Now that we've added statements to print the headlines, let's run the program and see if it works. Success.